who are the key people to you in in this evolution of the human being of the leader? Is it Petrushev? Is it Shoigu, the Minister of Defense? Is it like you mentioned, Peskov, the Press Secretary? Uh, what role do some of the others like Lavrov play? I think it's more rooted in the larger context. I mean, individuals matter in that context, but it's just kind of like this shared worldview. And if you go back to the early 1990s, immediately after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, when Yeltsin, you know, and uh, the, uh, his counterparts from Ukraine and Belarus pull it apart, there was an awful lot of people who, you know, wanted to maintain the Soviet Union, not just Putin. I mean, you remember after uh, Gorbachev tried to have the new Union Treaty. Um, in um, 1991, and there was the emergency committee set up, the coup against Gorbachev. It was because they were worrying he was going too far and unraveling, you know, the union then as well. They, they were opposed to his reforms. There's always been a, a kind of a very strong nationalist contingent that become Russian nationalists over time rather than Soviet, you know, hardliners who, you know, basically want to maintain the empire, the union in some form. And in the very early part of the 1990s, there was a lot of pressure put on Ukraine and all the other former Soviet republics, now independent states, by people around, you know, Mayor Lushkov, for example, in uh, Moscow, uh, by, you know, other forces in the Russian uh, Duma, not just, you know, Vladimir Zhirinovsky and others, but, you know, really serious, you know, kind of what we would call here, like right-wing, you know, nationalist uh, forces. But it's, you know, pervasive in the system. And it's especially pervasive in the KGB and in the security sector. And that's where Putin comes out of. Remember, Putin also was of the opinion that one of the biggest mistakes the Bolsheviks made was getting rid of the Orthodox Church as an instrument of the state. And so there's this kind of restorationist wing within the security services and the state apparatus that want to kind of bring back Russian Orthodoxy as a state instrument, an instrument of state power. And they were kind of, you know, looking all the time about strengthening the state, uh, the executive, the, the, the presidency. And, and so it's everybody who takes part in that. And it's also others who want power, honestly. And they see Putin as their vehicle for power. I think people like Sergei Kirienko. I knew Kirienko back in the 90s. I mean, my God, that guy's all in. Or like Dmitry Medvedev, you know, who was, you know, a warmer, fuzzier version of Putin certainly had a totally different perspective, wasn't in the KGB. Did you say warmer, a, fuzzier version? A warmer, version? fuzzier version, yeah. I mean, he's kind of okay. like, he was literally a warm personality. I don't know if you watched him during the September 30th annexation. The guy had all kinds of facial twitches and looked so rigid and stiff that he looks like he might implode. I mean, that wasn't, you know, how he was, you know, earlier in his career. And he, you know, had a different view of perestroika. We always have to remember that Putin was not in Russia during perestroika. He was in Dresden watching the... Um, East German state fall apart and, you know, dealing with the Stasi and in a kind of place where you weren't getting a lot of information about what was happening in West Germany or even what was happening back home in Perestroika. And he has that kind of group of people around him, the Patrushevs and Botnikovs and others and Sergei Ivanov and others, you know, from, uh, you know, the different configurations of his administration who have come out of that same kind of mindset. And are kind of, you know, wanting to sort of put everything back together again. So there's a lot of enablers and a lot of, you know, power seekers. And there are a lot of people who, you know, think the same as him as well. He's, he is a man of his times, a man of his context. You as a top advisor yourself and, and a scholar of Putin, do you think it actually now in his inner circle, are there people he trusts? There are people he trusts for some things. But I don't think there's people he trusts for everything. I don't think he's the kind of person who tells anyone everything at all. I don't think he's got something Ever he deeply confides in. No, he, he's, he's com he, I think he compartmentalizes things. He's often said that the only person he trusts is himself. And I think that's probably true. He's the kind of person who keeps his own counsel. I mean, people talk about Kovalchuk, for example, or, you know, kind of some of the other people who are, you know, friends uh, with him that going to go back to his time in St. Petersburg. You know, at various points, he seemed to, you know, spend a lot of time you know, way back when talking to people who were, you know, people think of kind of more moderating forces like Alexei Kudrin, but, you know, it doesn't seem to be interacting, you know, with them. You know, there are obviously aspects of his personal life, you know, does he speak to his daughters? Does he, you know, speak to, you know, kind of lovers, you know, kind of in a way people speculate about, you know, kind of who might he confide in, but I would greatly doubt that he would have deep political discussions with them. He's a very guarded uh, very careful 
person. What about sources of information then? So trust, a deep understanding about military strategies with uh, for certain conflicts, like the war in Ukraine or even special uh, subsets of the war in Ukraine or any kind of military operations, getting clear I think information. He's deeply suspicious, you know, of people and of, of information. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, part of, of the problems that, you know, we see with Putin now, I mean, I've come from isolation during COVID. I'm, I'm, I'm really convinced that, you know, like many of us, you know, a lot of Putin's views have hardened and the way that he looks at the world have been shadowed in very dark ways by the experience of this pandemic. You know, obviously he was in a bubble, different kind of bubble from most of us. I mean, most of us are not in bubbles with multiple, you know, kind of palaces and, you know, kind of the Kremlin. But, you know, we've seen, you know, so much, it's obviously a lot of this is staged, that isolation, you know, the kind of making it very clear that he's the czar, the guy who is in charge making all the decisions, you know, one end of the table and everybody else is at the other end. But, you know, it's, it's very difficult then to bring, you know, information to him in that way. He used to have a lot of information bundled for him in the old days by the presidential administration. I mean, I know that because it was a lot more open in the past. And I have a lot of meetings with you know, people in the presidential administration who brought outside, you know, would say all source information, you know, for him and, you know, kind of funneled in information from different think tanks and, you know, different viewpoints and maybe a kind of more eclectic diversified set of information. He would meet with people. You know, you've heard all the stories about where he had uh, once called up Masha Gessen, you know, and had to, you know, come in, you know, obviously a, a you know, a very different character as a, as a journalist and a critic. You know, we've heard about Venedictive from Echo Moscovy, the, you know, the radio program, the, the editor who uh, Putin would, you know, talk to and consult with. He'd, he'd, he'd reach out. People, um, like uh, Ludmila Alexeyeva, for example, the head of Memorial, he had some respect for her and would, you know, sometimes just, you know, talk to her, you know, for example. All of that seems to have come to a halt. Can you and I think why? I think a lot of us worry, I mean, us who, you know, watch Putin about what kind of information is he getting? You know, is it is it just the information that he's seeking and gathering himself that fits into his worldview and his framework? We're all guilty of that, of looking for things. It gets to our social media preferences. Are people just bringing to him things that they think he wants to hear? Like the algorithm, you know, kind of like the Kremlin working in that regard. Or is he himself, you know, tapping into source of information that he absolutely wants? And remember, he is not a military guy. He's an operative and he was sort of trained in operations and, you know, contingency planning. Sergei Shoigu, the defense minister, as a civil engineer, was the former minister of emergencies. He wasn't a military planner. You know, somebody like um, Gerasimov, the uh, head of uh, the chiefs of staff, maybe a military guy, you know, in this, you know, case from the army, but he's also somebody who's in a different part of the chain of command. He's not somebody who would spontaneously start, you know, telling Putin things. And Putin, you know, comes out of the FSB, out of the KGB of the Soviet era, and he knows the way that, you know, intelligence gets filtered and works. He's probably somebody who wants to consume raw intelligence. He doesn't probably want to hear anybody else's analysis. And he's thrived in the past of, you know, picking things up from people. You know, I've taken part in all of these meetings with him, gone for hours, because he's just collecting. He's collecting information. He's sussing people out. He wants to know the questions they ask. He, he learns something about the questions that people ask, the way that they ask them. You know, so he's kind of soliciting information himself. And if he's cut off from that information you know, because of circumstances, then, you know, how is he formulating things in his head? And again, getting into, you can't get into his head, but you can understand the context in which he's operating. And that's where you worry, because he clearly made this decision to invade Ukraine behind the back of most of his security establishment. You think so? Oh, I think it's pretty apparent. Uh, what, uh... What, what would the security establishment, what would be the... Well, that would be the larger, you know, thinking of the funneling in information from the uh, presidential administration, from the National Security Council. It looks like, you know, he made that decision with a handful of people. And then, you know, having worked in these kinds of environments, and it's not that dissimilar, you filter information up. So think about, you know, you and I are talking for hours here. Um, if, if you were my, you know, uh, basically, um, you know, senior official and I'm your briefer, I might only get 20 minutes with you. And you might be just like, you know, looking at your watch the whole time and thinking, hang on a second, I've got to go and I've got this meeting and I've got that meeting. And yeah, your point. 
-hmm. You're not going to wait there. So I give this long explanation. I've got to get to the point. And then I've got to then choose for myself what's the information I'm going to impart to you. Out of the 20 things that I think are important, you know, okay, I've got 20 minutes. Maybe I only suddenly get two minutes. Maybe, you know, you get called out yeah. and, and somebody, you know, kind of interrupts. Something happens. I'm going to get one minute, two minutes. Yeah. I mean, I once remember I had to give a presentation <laughs> when I was in government, it's too real. you know, to um, yeah. Henry Kissinger, you know, for that defense policy board. And we planned bloody weeks on this thing. You know, PowerPoints were created, teams of people were brought together. And, you know, people were practicing this. We had all these, you know, different people there. And I said, look, Henry Kissinger's an academic and a former professor. And, you know, I happen to, you know, I've got to watch him in action. He's going to like, you know, five seconds in, if we're, if, if we're lucky, we get that far, ask us a question and just throw off our entire presentation. What is it that we want to convey? And that's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, people aren't really prepared what they wanted to convey. And they, you know, they prepared a, you know, a nice sort of fulsome, you know, PowerPoint-like approach. We never even got there. Yeah. And so God knows what, you know, he took away from it at the end of it. And that's, you know, think about Putin. He's going to be kind of impatient. He's, you know, we see the televised things where he, you know, kind of sits at a table a bit like, you know, people won't necessarily see us here. And he puts his hands on the table and he looks across at the person and he says, so tell me, you know, what's the main things I need to know? And of course, the person's mind probably goes blank. <laughs> you know, with the, the kind of the thought of like, oh God, what's the main thing? Yeah. <laughs> and they go and they start, well, Vladimir Vladimirovich. And, you know, they they, they, they start the kind of, you know, they're, they're revving up, you know, to get to the point and then he cuts them off. So you think about that and then you think about, well, what information has he got? And then how does he process it? And is he suspicious of it? Does he not believe it? And, and what, on what inside of his own history then, you know, leads him to make one judgment over another?